we must pass over in silence. End of book. Well, do you follow the line of thought? Okay. Um, it's very much the same as Russell at this stage. Very much the same, yeah. Except that it moves, I think, um, in the way it's stated, several steps closer to logical positivism itself. Several steps closer. Questions? Comments? John? No. Yeah. Um, he, what he's really saying, I think, um, uh, underneath all of this, is that the problem of the meaning of life is an empirically meaningless problem. Um, a meaningful problem is one which is asking factual questions. Um, this is not asking factual questions. What is the meaning of life? And if you say the meaning of life is the fact that there is a life hereafter in which it all comes clear or something of that sort, then um, you are saying that the meaning of life is outside of life. So how could that be answered in empirical ways? Yeah, it's interesting to note what other empiricists have done with that question that he raised. Um, there was a debate between two individuals, both logical positivists, Rudolf Carnap and Moritz Schlick. And I think this was um, a debate in the British Journal of Philosophy of Science, back in the 20s as I recall in which I think it was um, Schlick argued that discussion of immortality um, of a future state is empirically meaningless. Carnap argued, no, it might be empirically meaningful if it turns out that we have empirical data thereafter. Hereafter, you see. And John Hick, the uh, British philosopher of religion, um, at one stage in his thinking, and he's gone through various stages, he's now in a very different one, uh, but at one stage when he was discussing the meaning of religious language in empiricist terms, uh, talked of eschatological verification. You see, Carnap seemed to say that belief in immortality would be capable of eschatological verification, so it's empirically meaningful. Well, Hick wanted to say that um, the Christian faith as such is capable of eschatological verification. So that on the last day, John, you can say to somebody, hey, I told you so. You um, yeah, so if you get an extended definition of the empirical, then future experience could in principle account. Okay. Does he do anything with um, aesthetic or like aesthetic or like yes. imaginative writing? <laughs> um, he does, but I don't know what he does say about aesthetics. Is there anybody here who took the Wittgenstein seminar? Got into the aesthetics? You ventured into it, didn't you? What does he say about aesthetics? Can you help us? There is a recent um, collection of fragments from him that include comments on aesthetics. I haven't read it. Neither have I. Um, well, I don't think we didn't discuss anything that he said in his earlier work. We just discussed yeah. with his. It would be in his later work when he's coming at ordinary language in less than scientific terms. Yeah. So before it's not really an issue. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, let me, let me say this then about his later work. Um, what he does in the earlier work, he has second questions, second thoughts about later on. 
the Tractatus was published in 1921. In 1929, he left Cambridge and dropped out of philosophy, not coming back until um, the 40s. And in 1945, he published Philosophical Investigations. In that book, he tells us that the picture theory of meaning has no clear meaning. And that comment of his gave rise to the self-referentiality criticism of the verifiability theory. Namely, that if to be verifiable, a proposition has to be empirically accessible, well, the verifiability theory of meaning is not empirically accessible. So it's not verifiable. You see. Uh, so, and that was one of the things which led to the downfall of logical positivism. Uh, he also suggested that Russell's dream of atomic propositions, indivisible units of thought, is um, uh, too vague. There is no clear criterion for an atomic proposition. And um, uh, the notion of an ideal language is too artificial. He says things like logical language and symbolic language are like parade ground foot drill for soldiers. Fine for teaching logical discipline, but you don't use them on the battlefield. You see. And it was with that that he abandoned this scientism, trying to narrow all meaningful discourse to scientific discourse and um, started um, talking about language games. That is to say, there are a variety of different language functions of which scientific type language is only one. And I take it that Ryan is saying that aesthetic language might uh, be understandable in those ways. Okay. How are we doing? Looks like time. Okay, um, Monday we'll get into logical positivism as such. Um, and uh, that means AJ Ayer. What I'm planning to do is to